With today's lecture, we get to talk about ancient Greece. In our last chapter, we had learned about the Aegean culture and how it fell into the Dark Ages around 1200 BC. So now we're going to fast forward around 400 years, and now we're in 800 BC, emerging into one of the most significant civilizations we're going to cover over the entire semester, the Greek civilization. Greek art and architecture are going to be used to measure future artistic achievements. Even the Romans will keep Greek art and culture alive and spread it throughout their kingdom. And the term we use to talk about this is Hellenism. When we get to the end of the book, we start to learn about the Italian Renaissance. And the artists here are going to look back at the Greek civilization as a high point of artistic achievement and bring back into use many of their techniques, such as the contrapposto stance. The Greeks contributed not only to art, but to politics, literature, math, and science. So I want to take a few minutes and talk about the Olympic Games, which we have at first documented around 776 BC. There were no stopwatches or measurements recorded. In fact, no record keeping was known for the first 200 years of the Olympic Games. Travelers came from all over the known world, and it was very much like a carnival or circus atmosphere. You would have merchants with wine and fruit stands, vendors that would sell lucky charms. There would be singers, dancers, acrobats, and jugglers. But would someone have really wanted to go to the Olympic Games back then? You can think of how poor the road conditions would be, no lodging for you. The food would only be available from roadside stands, and drinking water would be very tough to come by. Only nine freshwater sources for literally thousands of visitors in the scorching heat, all the way to the pouring rain. But the good news is that during the Olympic Games there was a military truce, so that you could travel from neighboring city-states without fear. The Olympics back then would only run for five days, the first day being set aside for a celebration. The second day was the chariot races, horse races, and pentathlon. Day three began with the sacrifice to Zeus, followed by the boys' events, and the boys would be ranged in age from 17 to 20. Day four would be running, boxing, wrestling, and day five, a victory banquet. The Olympics started out very pure, but then became professional. This was one way for a person born in the lower social economic classes to rise in the ranks. However, corruption begins, and we even have documented bribes. Greece was also very much a man's society. Women were there to run the household and prepare the meals, but other than that, they were kept out of sight. Marriages were to be arranged by the woman's father, and then she fell under the control of her husband. When we look at religion, you should note that Greece, like Egypt, is a polytheistic culture. They believed in many gods. However, their gods were different than the Egyptian gods because they were very much human. In fact, Sophocles has a wonderful quote. It says, The world is full of wonders, but nothing more wondrous than man. When the Romans conquer the Greeks, their gods take on Roman names. So, for instance, we have Zeus becoming Jupiter, Athena becoming Minerva, and Heracles becoming Hercules. We're going to study five distinct areas of Greek art. We start off with the geometric or orientalizing period. Then we have the archaic, followed by the early and high classical, the late classical, and then the Hellenistic. So let's look at the geometric or orientalizing period first. One of the greatest works of this time is the Dipylon vase and it gets its name from the cemetery where it was found, the Dipylon Cemetery. Later in the lecture, we'll look at a specific slide 
that covers all the different types of pottery made by the Greeks, and they each have their own distinct name. This one is called a crater, which um, is basically a two-handled vessel used for storing or mixing wine and water. It's made from terracotta, and the work itself is reassembled from broken pieces. It was reserved for the very rich to be used as graves, as headstones at the gravesite. And what was really cool about them is that they were drilled with holes at the bottom. And the idea was you would come to the graveyard and you would pour some wine into the vessel and it would trickle down into the earth so you would be having a drink with your deceased friend or family member. When we look closer at the details of this vase, um, it's really cool. You can definitely see the geometric patterns present both in the design as well as the figures. So you easily can determine that it's from the geometric period. We have a cremation taking place in the top register in the center with the uh, gentleman uh, laying down prostrate. Then we have the figures on either side literally pulling their hair out in anguish. So we can tell that this is a, a Greek civilization uh, with the cremation. In Egypt, you know, we have the mum mummification process. Down below in the lower register, we have uh, a very flat field of vision. Uh, you can see the horses lined up one behind the other but their legs look like they're in a row. Uh, we also have very angular forms for the figures, and it looks like these warriors, their shields are extremely abstracted to where they're part of their body. Another um, image is the Manticlos Apollo, and we're going to look at the time period, calling it orientalizing, because of the trade and contact with the Orient, the Near and Middle East, meaning Egypt, Syria, and Mesopotamia. Don't forget that from the very beginning of Greek art, the focus is on the male body. Uh, female bodies were clothed until much later on in the Greek civilization. The gods, they have human forms, but they also have the emotions and weaknesses that we have. The Lady of Auxerre, and we call her that because she was found in a storeroom at the Museum of Auxerre, and they're not really quite sure how she ended up there. She's made from limestone, native to the island of Crete, and she's very geometric. The hair itself even looks as if it's Egyptian in style. She's short, about two feet tall, and today you can find her in the Louvre Museum. So we're going to move on to the Archaic period next. We'll begin with this Koros, which translates into young man in Greek. And this is a life-size sculpture, about five and a half feet tall. But notice very much that archaic smile. It's kind of like the smile we see on the Mona Lisa. It's just very, very slight. This, like the dipylon vase, serves, served as a grave marker. And the face itself looks very much like a mask rather than an individual person. You can see the almond-shaped eyes and, again, the braided hair, just like the woman of Auxerre. When we compare it to some previous artwork, uh, such as Mankari and his wife, you can see it's very similar in form, and that's why we have this correlation with their art during this time period. Um, the bodies are very geometric still, as is the hair, and we have the idea of motion, the illusion of motion, with one foot put in front of the other. This is another Koros, but we have a particular name that we associate with it. So we call it the Chrysios boy. And this is a young man who had died in a war. 
and it's approximately 70 years after the previous sculpture we just looked at of the Koros. We can already see that the figure itself is much more human than geometric, like the previous work. We also have that illusion of movement, although it is very, very slight. But the idea here is that we haven't really created the spine as this axis to be able to move the, the figure yet. It's very rigid, very upright. Here's the calf bearer with an archaic smile. And a lot of these sculptures are damaged not because uh, they're old or because they were damaged during a war or anything, but a lot of these were found in pits. Uh, once conquerors came through, they would take a lot of the sculptures and throw them and bury them in these pits. Uh, the bronze sculptures, which were very, very common in Greece, they were melted down and reused, the, the metal reused, whereas you can't really reuse marble. So they were just buried and used as fill. So that's what we have with this sculpture as well as the next one, which is the Peplos core. So whereas the Koros is a young man, a core is a young woman or a maiden. And female sculptures, as I mentioned before, are always going to be dressed until we get to the very end of the Greek civilization. Uh, a peplos is a long woolen belted garment, which was very common attire for women of that day. Many of these sculptures were damaged during the sack of the Acropolis in 480 BC. And with these sculptures as well, Today we see them as very stark, very white, and that allows us to really pay attention to the form of the figure itself, how it was created. But in reality, all these sculptures, as well as the architecture we're going to look at, were painted. Uh, very gaudy colors, very loud, very bright, very exciting. The core in the Ionian dress is wearing kind of a very fashionable outfit for the day. Uh, we have uh, a chitin, which is what she's wearing. That's the long woolen tunic. And then atop that is a hemation. And that's kind of like a, a Roman toga. In the next video, we'll take a look at Greek architecture. This is part two of our lecture on ancient Greece, and we're going to take a look first at the Greek architecture, and particularly, you need to know about the three orders of Greek architecture. They're very simple, and they are very distinct. We have the Doric, the Ionic, and then the Corinthian, and they're created during different time frames. However, we're really going to look at them all together here. The first one is the Doric order. Now, this is the oldest of all the three orders, originating around 600 BC, and is considered very masculine. The columns themselves tend to be on the short side, on the bulky side, and you can see that they're fluted as well. They're identified, in fact, all the orders are identified by the, the ornamentation that you'll see at the top of the column, which is called the capital. Now, in the Doric order, there is a lack of ornamentation. It's just smooth right up to the top. The most common place that you'll find the Doric order is on the Parthenon, and we'll talk about this later on in the lecture. The Ionic Order is next, and this originates around 440 BC, considered to be feminine, and it adorns the temples of the female goddesses. The style is imported from Ionia, which is a territory today which is known as Turkey. But it's an imported style, and again, very easily recognizable by the two volutes, or swirls, on either side of the column. And here we have it on 
the Temple of Nike, also on the Parthenon, or, or next to the Parthenon, actually, on top of the Acropolis. And then the most common, at least the most popular, is the Corinthian order. Now, it can be, there can be variances as far as the capital is concerned. Sometimes there's rosettes, sometimes there's acanthus leaves, and other various forms of plant life. The Greeks really prized this order and put it in the most sacred parts of the temple, which is the interior. That's where the gods lived. However, when the Romans take over, we're going to see that they put these everywhere, particularly along the colonnade because they wanted them to be viewed. So the colonnade is this area here, which is the outermost row of columns. Now, this is, looking up at the top here, this is uh, done in the Corinthian order. And we can tell that this would have been a Roman structure then, since it's on the outside perimeter rather than exclusively in the interior. Now, intasis is a term that's really kind of cool. It deals with the curvature of the columns. Now, columns are tapered toward the top. And what this does is it corrects for an optical illusion. If we had actually done these straight vertical, 90 degree angle, something perpendicular to the ground, at a distance these would have looked crooked. But the Greeks were aware of this, and what they did was they tapered the column so that when they were looked at at a distance, they would then look straight, correcting our optical illusion. Keep in mind also that columns are made up of individual components called drums. So they're not one solid piece of marble, or at least very rarely they are. That's usually done during the Roman Empire. But during the Greeks, they're all made out of columns. The columns are all made out of drums. So we'll take a look at a couple more of the Doric temples. Uh, this is the Temple of Hera, and we have two of them actually. This one done much more in the Archaic period, whereas the Temple of Hera number two, which is right next door, is done during the classical time. And you can see when they're placed one right next to the other, how more bulky and massive uh, the one at the left looks compared to the one at the right, which is a little bit more slender and taller. These are both in Italy, and during the time Italy is part of the Greek Empire. Temples also are unique because this is where the gods lived. This is not really a place where you would go to pray like we saw in other cultures such as the Middle East. And of course, don't forget that the Greeks are very much into creating pottery. This one here, the Corinthian black figure Amphora, is, was actually found 50 miles east of Crete on the island of Rhodes. Other Greek pottery has been found in Italy, France, and even as far away as Russia. Pottery was made on a potter's wheel, and this is, you know, something that we've been literally using since approximately 4000 BC. After the shapes of the pots are formed, and then they would be put into a kiln and fired several times, usually around 1000 degrees Celsius. One of my favorite pots is the Revelers dates around 510 BC. And my favorite part about this is that this is the first time in history that we can associate an artist's name. This is the, the work that is signed by Euthymides, and he signed it very uniquely as Euthymides painted me. And this is called red figure pottery, and there's only about six or eight of Euthymides' works uh, still in existence today. So we're going to go ahead and move on into the classical period. 
and we'll start with the Temple of Aphaea. It's located on the island of Aegina, which is visible from the Greek mainland. And here's a recreation of it. And I want to draw your attention to the sculptural part of the temple, which is right up here. This is called the pediment. And so it's kind of a very unique sculptural space. Of course, very triangular and also very difficult to fill. That's why you have a lot of uh, figures here lying down. The figure in the center is Athena, and you have warriors on either side. Just to give you an idea of what they look like in person, uh, the sculptures were found during the excavation of the temple and then sold at auction. They were bought by the Glyptothek in Russia, which is a museum devoted to storing and preserving Greek and Roman antiquities. Like the sculptures we looked at in the earlier video, where they were plain white, they had previously been painted a very gaudy color. And here is a recreation of what the archer would have looked like in common day Greece. Now pay particular attention to the dying warrior. And these are, we're looking at the east and west pediments of the Temple of Aphaea. And there is a quiz question that deals particularly with these two sculptures. This one here, as well as the previous work, uh, excuse me, this uh, dying warrior here is done in the classical style, where the previous one here uh, is done in the archaic style. You can see that smile, the braided hair, and the figure itself, while there's an attempt to make it look human, it still looks rather manufactured. Whereas this one here, we have much more of a muscular body. We have the weight of the body as it's dying. It feels like it's crushing down to the earth. The soldier himself is trying to get up, straining on his shield and failing to get up. So make sure you can see the difference between these two works, one being done in the archaic style, in the archaic period, and the other one, the one below, done only 10 years later, and that's done during the classical period. Another sculpture of interest during this time, and this is not on the Temple of Aphaea, is the Critios boy. And it's extremely significant because this sculpture is much more fluid. It's the first time we see a weight shift in the body where we use an axis uh, of the spine. And that term that you want to associate with this is contraposto. And it's going to be more visible in some later sculptures. And we can definitely see it here in the Riachi Warrior. This sculpture here is pretty awesome because it's bronze. And it's sad to think that about one-third of Greek sculpture has been melted down and lost, uh, recreated into other objects. This one, I don't know if you can call it lucky enough, but it was lucky enough to be in a shipwreck off the coast of Riachi, Italy. And it was underwater for 2,000 years. And this has gone through years of restoration. It is missing the spear, helmet, and shield. And it's made from the lost wax casting method. So as we studied it in the Middle East chapter, this is a hollow sculpture. The charioteer from Delphi. This is a portion of a sculptural set. And I'll show you that in just a moment. And the sculpture is not as lifelike as the previous works we just saw, such as the Riachi warrior. But what's happened here is this would have been a figure hidden by the chariot itself for most of its body. And so only the top portion would have been visible. And here's a recreation of what it would have looked like and what has been found so far.
This sculpture is either Zeus or Poseidon. We're not exactly sure which one, but it's a very unique sculpture in the position of the feet and arms as well as head. So it's kind of a sculpture that is in motion. It was also recovered from a shipwreck. And if it's Zeus, he's throwing a lightning bolt. If it's Poseidon, he was throwing the trident. And here we have the discus thrower. Many of the Greek sculptures that we see today are really Roman copies of the originals. And here, this is a really great sculpture because we see the figure himself in this position between motion. He's completely curled back, ready to throw the discus. It's not a true position of how the discus thrower would look in real life. And then he's going to release the discus. Um, there's really no strain in his face, although the body itself is um, in a really cool position, like fully wound up. And of course, there's, very, there's several of these sculptures, uh, again, all copies of the original. And we also want to look at the spear bearer called Doriphorus. And the sculptor, Polycleitos, establishes the rules for constructing the ideal human form. Basically, he uses the human head as the basis for the ratio. So the torso would be created from two human heads and the lower portion of the body, three. So we kind of have that system like you saw back in the Egyptian chapter where we have this ideal form that are all going to be very, very similar in size. And again, like the last work, this is a Roman copy of the original. So here we are at the Acropolis, and we're going to deal with this in the next video. And this is going to be our third and final segment on ancient Greek art. We're going to take a look at the Acropolis, which is really the crowning achievement of the Greek Empire. Acro means top, polis means city, and the funds that were used to create this masterpiece were expropriated from the general fund by Pericles, and this caused a, a tremendous amount of uprising from the citizens, thinking that this was a worthless project. And here we are 2,000 years later, and this is really, I think, the most significant architectural feat that the Greeks produce. This is how it would have looked like during the classical age of the Greek Empire. And the most important building on top of the Acropolis is the Parthenon. It was the first building constructed and dedicated to the goddess Athena. In fact, inside there was this incredibly large ivory and gold sculpture by Phidias. And I'll show you that image in just a moment. But when we look at the Parthenon, of course today it's in a huge uh, state of degradation. And there is a lot of work being used to conserve this building, to bring it back to what it originally looked like. And there's arguments throughout the world of art history about whether we should keep it the way it is or should we build it back to how it looked when it was brand new. And I'll have a link on the Moodle site for you to take a look at the reconstruction efforts. Here's the sculpture by Phidias, or what we think it looked like. And also, when we look at the Greek temples, and we'll go back to this image here, the column structure for the temples is really an algebraic equation. 2x plus 1 equals y. So where we have the Parthenon with eight columns around the front, the sides would then be 2x, or 16, plus 1 is 17. So it's 8 by 17 columns. Ratio is 9 to 4. We use the illusionistic corrections uh, of intasis, like we talked about in the previous video. So the columns are tapered as they get toward the top to make them look straight. We also have corrections in the flooring, 
where the floor of the Parthenon looks very straight, it really isn't. There's a small rise about two inches along the front and about four inches along the length. The columns at the corners, they're also thicker. Now, the sculptures here were from the Parthenon, but in the 1800s, the Greeks had been taken over by the Ottoman Empire, and they sold about half of the remaining sculptures from the Parthenon to Lord Elgin, and he took them to the British Museum. When the Ottoman Empire fell in Greece in 1832, Greece has asked for them back, and the British Museum has refused to return them. So there are a couple videos on the Moodle site that deal with these, both the left side, which is the image we just saw, and this right side. But these are some of the most important sculptures we believe that were created during the Greek Empire. This is an example of low relief sculpture. This was also from the Parthenon, and you can see how firmly attached these figures are. Even though they're well sculpted, we don't believe that they can really be set free from the background. Later in this lecture, I'll show you some high relief sculptures, and you'll really be able to tell the difference between the two. About 40 feet away from the Parthenon, when you look off to the left as you're standing in front of the building, is the Erechtheion. And this is one of the more unique temples that we see. Uh, along the front, you can see the columns with the, the scrolls or volutes. So this is a, a building that's made in the Ionic order. And it's a building that was never completed. It's kind of like how you continually add on to a house or a structure, and the rooms themselves don't seem to go. That's this building. Uh, but one of the neatest things about this structure is the porch that we see along the lower left side of it. Instead of columns, we have these figures, and we call them the caryatids. And I do have a video that go goes into depth about these, uh, as there's one of these at the British Museum as well. But there's a certain delicacy uh, to this temple. It is taller. It is thinner. Uh, as well. And of course, uh, in the last image, and I'll go back to it here, we see an olive tree planted right there. And it was thought that uh, Athena was the one that planted the olive tree. As we go into the late classical age in Greek history, this is considered a period of decline. We have the Peloponnesian Wars between Athens and Sparta, and we have the death of Alexander the Great marked at 323 BC. That's when the empire is broken up into several pieces. The works that we see during this time period are also much more emotional than we have seen previously. We have the sculpture of Aphrodite. And sculpture begins to change also. Here's one of the first times we have a nude female figure. Up to this age, all of the female figures are dressed. It's the male figures that are nude. And we also call her the Aphrodite of Nidos, which is the area, or actually the island, uh, where she was found. With Hermes and Dionysus, we have a, a real great indication of the contraposto stance. Now, this position is where the hips and legs are in a much different position than the shoulders and the head. What it does is it adds a certain amount of dynamism to the sculpture, the idea that this is a true human form rather than a marble sculpture. It's more traditionally of how we stand. And we can also think of contraposto as a weight shift. Now, Hermes is the full-grown figure here. Dionysus is the child. 
we originally think that Hermes' hand was extended holding a cluster of grapes, Dionysus uh, reaching out since he is the god of wine. After the death of Alexander the Great, we have what's considered the Hellenistic period. It's art that contains expressiveness and drama. It's the final phase of Greek art. And the term Hellenistic means that we have the influence of Greek art and culture really throughout a kingdom or area that's not necessarily Greek. When we look at the map here, at the death of Alexander the Great, this is the largest expanse of Greek emphasis on the known world. We have Greek art down here in Egypt and North Africa. We have it up here through Greece and into Italy. And then we have down into the Indus Valley here, a, a very large area. And all this would be considered Hellenistic Greece. One of the most important artworks was the Altar of Zeus, which was located in Pergamon, which is in Turkey. And we look at the frieze, which is this area down here of all this great action. This is high relief sculpture, and we'll look at a couple of the images closer up. But it's so exciting because it looks as if they are spilling into the walkway where we are. High relief sculpture is really where the sculpture looks three-dimensional, and it's almost set against the background rather than being part of it, which is what we see a lot in low relief. So the frieze depicts the battle between the gods of Mount Olympus and the giants of Earth. And it always, to me, when I looked at that earlier image, it always looked like a toy model. And it's not. It is really a full-sized altar. So here's some people walking up the steps, just to give you an idea of how incredibly large it is. And here we have a close-up of the frieze. And again, you can see how the figures are spilling into our space. It's especially back in this area here, we have literally both legs of the figure on the steps. And this entire temple also, or altar, would have been painted just like the Temple of Ephea was, very bright, very gaudy colors. Now, this very much like the Elgin marbles is being asked to be returned. Today, this is in uh, the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, but Turkey is asking for it back. It was originally torn down around the, uh, the 8th century AD. Now, moving on where this Gaelic chieftain is killing himself and his wife, we also have the contraposto stance here, but we have a very violent uh, act. It really celebrates uh, a Greek victory over the Gauls, and the chieftain here is one of the Gauls. So rather than being taken captive, the chieftain takes his own life, and he's already slain his own wife. We can see that there's outsider differences presented here. The chieftain has a mustache, much more choppier hair, so he looks very different than the Greeks do. The same with Dying Gaul, and I do have a video up online for you to watch of this artwork in particular. So we're going to move on to the next sculpture, which is the Victory of Samothrace. And this is one of the most important sculptures we have from the Greek civilization. Nine feet high, and she sits atop the grand staircase in the Louvre. With this work, it's really all about motion. And where she was found uh, is really incredible. We look at it today as, you know, one entire sculpture that's solid. But really, she was created from several hundred pieces that were found and reconstructed. 
Um, she was found on the island of Samothrace in a sanctuary in the harbor. And looking back in the day, how amazing that must have been, as if the wind was kind of blowing in from the ocean toward her. With the Venus de Milo, even though this is a Venus and named after the Romans uh, goddess, she is uh, Aphrodite as well. But one of the most uh, recognizable sculptures from the Greek uh, time period. Uh, a peasant found this sculpture on the island of uh, Milos in 1820. Fragments of arms and a pedestal with an inscription was also found, but no one knows where they are today. They've been lost over time. She's also located in the Louvre Museum. And the last sculpture I want to go over is Sleeping Eros, dating 150 to 100 BC. This is one of the few remaining bronze sculptures from the Greek era. Uh, this is in the Met in New York. And lots of reproductions of this sculpture have been made, even during the time that this sculpture was popular during the Greek civilization, because it would be put in uh, gardens throughout the empire. But again, we have something that is uh, very young and uh, really quite a great sculpture. And actually, there is one more I want to talk about, the old market woman. Again, we can kind of see going from very young to very old and really a lot more theatricality into this work. We're not interested so much in beauty. She looks tired and old rather than heroic. And so there is a certain theatricality to this work, which we see throughout the Hellenistic time period. And with that, that's the end of our lectures on ancient Greek art.